Now last week, if you remember, we saw Samuel telling Saul that God was going to remove the kingship from him. Um, the reason for this was because Saul, who, although he was humble, he was, he was little in his own sight, when God chose him to become king, what happened to Saul? He became lifted up in pride. He refused to obey God while pretending that he was doing what God wanted him to do. He was, he was pretending, yeah, I'm doing what God wants, well, it's an action, when, when in actual fact he wasn't. He was being disobedient. I mean, if you look back at chapter number 15, look at um, verse number 19, uh, Samuel says here, he says, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. <coughs> but the people, notice he's blaming the other people, took of the spoil, <coughs> sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken or to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So what we're going to see as we jump into chapter number 16, we're going to see now where Saul's rebellion um, leads him. And we're going to, in chapter 16, in fact, as we go through the rest of the book, we're going to see that Saul's rebellion leads him into some pretty dark places. Let's have a look at verse number 1 of chapter 16. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So here we can see that Samuel, he was still sad about what had happened to Saul. But what does God say? He tells him, look, you've mourned long enough. You've mourned long enough. And he sends him to Bethlehem to choose out the next king of Israel from among the sons of Jesse. And one of the things this tells us is like, I mean, when bad things happen, it's okay to be grieved about it. You know, obviously, depending on what it is that happens, you know, might depend on how grieved you are. But whatever the case, there's a time, there comes a time when you've got to move on with life. There comes a time when you've got to move on with your life. Look, if you would, at um, uh, Ephesians chapter number 4. Look at Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 22. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 22. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse, num- verse number 22. It says, That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the dece- deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's saying, look, the old man, get rid of what's in the past and put on the new man. Move on to something better in the future. Look, if you would, at First Peter, First Peter chapter number 1, First Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 13, First Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 13, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Notice this, obedient children. Of course, one of the problems with Saul was he was disobedient. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance. So this is what you were like, your former lusts, change that. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversations, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And of course, turn to Philippians chapter number 3. This is probably the most famous passage when it, when it talks about, you know, you had what it used to be like, but now that needs to change. Look at Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 13. Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that's a, a theme you see throughout the Bible. Forget what's behind and move on. I mean, whatever hap- whatever's happened in the past, you can't change that. There's nothing you can do. You can't go back and alter the past. You can't. But what you can do is you can look at what you're going to do from here on. You know, I mean, start of the year is a great time to do that. To say, look, this is 2019. What am I going to do in 2019? 2018, that's been and gone. Maybe it was a good year. Maybe it wasn't a good year. Whatever it was, this year can be better. But if you want it to be better, you're going to have to decide, I'm going to obey God this year. I'm going to do what God wants me to do this year. Let's look back at um, 1 Samuel chapter number 16, verse number 2. And Samuel said, 
how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. So Samuel is actually concerned that Saul's going to kill him. If he hears he's going to you know, anoint a new king, you know, you can kind of understand. He's the current king, and if Samuel's going to go and choose another king, there could be trouble at that. Okay? Um, but what is God? But, but God just tells him, look, this is what you need to do. You know? He says, look, this is what you need to do. And we need to be, be willing to obey God rather than man, regardless of the consequences. You see, there might be consequences. There might, you know, I mean, bad things can sometimes happen, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. We need to decide we're going to obey, do what God says to do. I mean, look if you were at uh, Acts chapter number 5. Acts chapter number 5, the early disciples had this attitude. Acts chapter number 5 and verse number 27. Acts chapter number 5, Acts chapter 5 and verse number 27. Acts 5 and verse number 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So this is the early disciples. They're being brought before the council. And the priest saying, look, we've told you, don't tell anyone about Jesus. And he says, what have you done? You've filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. You've told everyone and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And that should be our attitude. We should obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Notice, they're concerned about them, say, bringing the, bringing the blood, Jesus' blood upon us, like blaming them. And what's the first words out of his mouth? Whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour, and for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Notice, how important it is. God's giving the Holy Ghost to those who obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one of the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had a reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. So this guy, he's a doctor of the law, he's had a reputation. People think he knows a lot. He knows a lot. But let's have a look and see if he actually does know anything. He says, look, put, command to put the apostles forth a little space and said unto them, ye men of Israel, Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Now, I've heard people quote these verses to say, look, if God's in something, it's going to prosper. And if God's not in something, it's not going to prosper. Well, for starters, this is some unsaved God that said that. Yeah. And I mean, is that true? I mean, do you, think, do you think God was in the founding of Islam? What do you reckon? And yet, is it multiplying? Is it going all over the place? It is. Okay, so it's a, it's a silly thing to say. It's a silly thing to say, to say, look, you know, if, 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 if you're multiplying, if, if, if it's prospering, that means it must be of God. Well, if that's the case, then the, 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 the most prosperous, the, the best church in the world is the Catholic Church, isn't it? That's the biggest one. That's the one that's prospering the most, the most numbers. But of course, they're completely disobedient to what God says. Yeah. They preach a different gospel. Yeah. Okay, They're leading he people to hell just as much as, as Muhammad is leading people to hell. So just, not, just, so just because someone says it, that doesn't mean that it's true. Verse number 40, but lo and behold, because he's had a reputation, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And look at verse 42. Did they listen to them? And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So they said, stop. And what do they do? We're going to obey God rather than men. And they kept on doing exactly what they were doing. And we should have that same attitude. Look at um, uh, verse number four back in 1 Samuel 16. Verse number four. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake. So he obeyed God and he came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, comest thou peaceably? 
So unlike Saul, Samuel, he obeyed God. He went to Bethlehem. The elders are, you know, they're trembling. They're worried, saying, are you coming peaceably? You say, well, why would they do that? I mean, maybe because Samuel wasn't quite as mild-mannered as some people imagine prophets or men of God to be. I mean, if you just look, look, just look back at the end of the last chapter, verse number 33, what happened to Agag? And Samuel said, as thy sword hath made woman childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. He chopped them to pieces. That, guess what? What did God told them to do? Destroy Agag and the Amalekites. And Saul hadn't done it, so Samuel did it for him. Okay? Um... And remember, we also saw, um, I mean, Job was another example. Job, the most righteous man on the earth. We saw that last week. But what did he say? Describe, he describes all the good things he did. He helped widows and the fatherless and all these different things and break the jaws of the wicked. That's what Job did. He broke the jaws of the wicked. So that, that was a good and righteous thing to do. But having said that, there is a balance we need to have. There is a balance. So some people take this too far and say, well, we need to just carry on like Samuel Gung and just hack. Uh-huh. people left, right and centre. You know, I mean, we need to we need to realise the Bible also has a balance. Look, if you were to Titus chapter number three, look at Titus chapter number three. And of course, also be aware that where we get the majority of our doctrine from is the New Testament. The New Testament give us, gives us the clearest guidelines for how we should be behaving. Look at Titus chapter number three, verse number one. It says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man. To be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived. Notice, we were some, you know, we were foolish, we were disobedient, we were deceived. So when other people are doing that, you know, have a bit of grace, you know. It says that disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy. What were we like? We were hateful and hating one another. But that's not what we're supposed to be like anymore. I mean, didn't we sing before, John chapter number 13? A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. How can you tell a disciple of Jesus Christ? You should be able to tell by the love they have for their brethren. So if you see disciples of Jesus Christ who don't have love for their brethren, it makes you think, hmm, what sort of disciple are they? Not a good one. They're not following what Jesus said to do. But look what it says here. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared. Notice, God is kind and God is loving. So if you want to be like God, you need to be kind and you need to be loving. And then great verse just while we're there. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So there's a balance we need to see. Look, if you were at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And verse number 24, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, and verse number 24, and it says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. You see, a lot of people are hasty. They're in a hurry to do things, you know? And guess what? You do things in a hurry, you're going to sin. He that hasteth with his feet sinneth, it says in the book of Proverbs. Um, Verse number 25, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. So when people are opposing you, then instruct them what? Meekly. In meekness. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Look if you would at First Peter chapter number 3. First Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 14. First Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 14. First Peter chapter 3 and verse number 14. It says, but, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify. That means set apart, set apart, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, don't miss the last part, with meekness and fear. With meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Look back at chapter number 2. Chapter number 2 and verse number 21. Chapter number 2, verse number 21, you see, because Jesus is our example. We should be following him. Well, what was he like? For even hereunto were ye called, verse 21, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, 
he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. If you find someone and they're threatening people, are they following Jesus' example? Doesn't sound like it. Okay? Let's turn back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 16. 1 Samuel chapter number 16, verse number 5. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 5. And he said, so they said, comest thou peaceably? And he said, peaceably I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. So he comes peaceably. He comes peaceably. And he says that they need to sanctify themselves before coming to the sacrifice. Now, as we said, sanctify. The sanctify is a word we don't necessarily use nowadays. It's talking about like um, setting something apart. Um, it's also related to like cleansing. For example, if you have a look at um, look at Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 12. Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 12. It says, Wherefore Je Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So Jesus sanctified us with his own blood. What did he do with his blood? He cleansed us. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. Look, if you were at Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 26. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 26. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it. This is talking about Jesus Christ and the church. He says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. He's cleansing. We are cleansed through the word of God. In fact, look if you would at, um, look at John chapter number 17. John chapter number, number 17 uses this. It says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. And then it says in, um, is that right? Yeah, John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We'll look back in chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse number 3 says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So notice, what does the word do? It sanctifies. It cleanses us. And that's why it's so important that we are in the Bible. As God's people, we need to be reading the Bible every day. Read the Bible. You know, when you get up in the morning, read the Bible. When you go to bed at night, read the Bible. You know, when you stop for lunch, read the Bible. Okay? Because that's the thing that's going to cleanse us. It's the thing that's going to wash us. It's going to, it's going to transform our minds. Have a look at Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you want to know what God's will is? You've got to be in the Bible. You've got to be reading the Bible. That's the thing that's going to, and that's the thing that's going to transform you. Because as you read the Bible more, you start to think like God. You start to think like God. You see, if you don't read the Bible, if you just watch the telly, you know, you just listen to the radio, you know, you just live in the world, you'll think like the world. And whatever the world thinks, that's what you'll think. But if instead you shut off the TV, you know, you shut off the radio, and you tune in to God's word, then you'll start thinking like God. And what will happen? Your mind will be transformed. You'll be thinking differently. Um, turn back to 1 Samuel chapter number 16. Verse number 6, 1 Samuel chapter number 16, verse number 6. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab, so this is Samuel, and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So when he first sees Eliab, you know, he's the, he's the eldest, okay, he's the, he's the eldest. Jesse had a number of different sons, in fact, um, First Chronicles, I think, you probably don't need to turn there, but in First Chronicles, I should have written it down, First Chronicles chapter 2, um, it actually lists David's son. First Chronicles chapter 2, verse number 13. It says, And Jesse begat his firstborn Eliab, and Abinadab the second, and Shimmer the third, Nethanel the fourth, Rad Radai the fifth, Ozim the sixth, David the seventh. Okay, so it goes through all the children. Okay, and so we see them listed there in order. And back in uh, 1 Samuel, the first one that gets brought is the oldest one. It's Eliab. And he thinks, well, this must be the next king. Why does he think it must be the next king? Because he looked on him. He looked on him. So obviously, based on his appearance. But of course, it says in John chapter 5, verse 24, the Bible says, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So it's not about the appearance. Okay? Look at, um, look at verse number 7, and we'll see why this is. Look at verse number 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, so Samuel thought, yeah, this is going to be the one. The Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, 
but the Lord looketh on the heart. You see, man looks on the outward appearance. And that's all he can do. All he can do is look on the outward appearance. So it kind of makes sense. You should take care of your appearance. You know, don't dress like a slob. Don't be be, be slovenly. Don't be, you know, because your appearance, it's going to affect what people think of you. But the fact is, man looks on the outward appearance. I mean, that's why, that's why men look towards, you know, look, what's the religious organization that's got the most people? What's the one that's got the biggest buildings and the flashiest facilities? Well, that must be right. But it's not about that. It's not about the outward. It's about what's going on in the heart. God, he looks on the heart. Because, of course, that's something that only God can do. Only God can look on the heart. Did you know that we can't look on the heart? I can't see your heart. None, none of you can I see your heart. Okay? I mean, even if I was a surgeon, you know, if we did open heart surgery and, you know, cracked the chest open and, and saw the, the blood pump, guess what? I mean, I can see the physical heart, but I still can't see the real heart. I can't see the heart that God can see right inside you. And so that's kind of a reminder. We should be careful not to attribute motives to people when we don't really know them. Because we can't look on the heart. We don't know them. That can lead to all kinds of trouble. Look if you're at 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. In verse number, First Corinthians chapter thirteen. Look at verse number four. First Corinthians chapter number thirteen. In verse number four, it says, "Charity or love suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself." What's it? if you vaunt yourself? It's like you're lifting yourself up. It vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Notice this thinketh no evil. See, a lot of people get into trouble because what they're doing, they're thinking, well, I think I know why he's doing that. I think I know what he's really thinking. I know what his motives are. What are they doing? They're thinking evil. People do that, and it can lead them down a dark path. That's not something we should be doing. Have a look, if you would, at um, James chapter number four. James chapter number four. You see, don't be puffed up. Don't be lifted up with pride. Look at James chapter number four. James chapter number four and verse number 10. James chapter number four and verse number 10. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So instead of vaunting yourself, instead of lifting yourself up, then let God lift you up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? What are you doing judging someone, saying, I know what your motive is. I know what's going on in your heart. Do you? Well, you don't. God does. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't say, okay, well, the actions that person's doing is wrong. Yeah, sure, you can do that. But that's a different thing from judging your brother and the way that God can judge, because he can. Why? Because he can look on the heart. Okay? We shouldn't be judging our brother's hearts. What's going on? This is why they did it. And people do that. People, they, 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 you know, they see someone do something, something or say something, and they jump to some conclusion and say, Therefore, this is what's going on. You know, this is what that person's really like. You don't know that. You've got no idea. Okay, turn back to um, 1 Samuel chapter number 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 8. Verse number 8. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. Verse number, so each time, he's bringing a son. He brings a son. He brings a son. Each time God's saying, This is not the one. This is not the one. This is not the one. And now look at verse number 11. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? Is this all you've got? He says, Um... And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. So the youngest, he wasn't brought before Samuel. Presumably, I mean, maybe Jesse thought that, you know, there's no way he's going to pick David. You know, I won't even bother bringing him in front of them. Look at verse number 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So when David is brought before him, he has a beautiful countenance. Now, I mean, this maybe that could be a reflection of what's actually inside David. You know, I mean, it says in Psalm, don't you turn there, but Psalm forty-three five says, "Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him, who is the health of my countenance and my God." Yeah. Proverbs fifteen thirteen says, "A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance." 
what's going on on the, on, on the inside can come through and affect what's on the outside. Um, it also describes him, it says he's ruddy. Um, that can mean uh, reddish, can be, can be one um, example. Like if you look at, uh, where is it, Lamentations. Lamentations 4 and verse number 7. Excuse me, Lamentations 4 and verse number 7. Says, <clears throat> Her Nazarites were purer than snow, they were whiter than milk, they were more ruddy in body than rubies. So, what, what rubies means red, okay? It's, if, 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 that's what a, you know, their polishing was of sapphire. So, some people said, Well, this means, you know, it's, it's talking about being red. Some people have suggested that, that he had red hair. You know, some people say he's got sort of reddish skin, some people said he's had red hair. I'm not sure if that quite fits because if you look at Song of Solomon, yeah. Song of Solomon, chapter number five. Uh, Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, if I just get there, uh, verse number 10, Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 10, it says, look, my beloved is white and ruddy, which is what, what we saw before, the chiefest among 10,000, his head is as the most fine gold, his locks are bushy and black as a raven. So that doesn't, doesn't necessarily quite fit, because here someone's described as ruddy, and yet it seems like they've got black locks. So, I mean, maybe, maybe he's, you know, maybe it's rosy cheeks, or who would know? Um, but whatever the case... Um, the, the key thing is, it's not his appearance that caused him to be chosen. It's not his appearance that caused him to be chosen. The reason God chose him was because God looks on the heart. God looks on the heart. And if you turn, if you go to Acts chapter number 13, Acts chapter number 13, and we'll see what it says about David. Acts chapter number 13 and verse number 22. Acts chapter 13 and verse number 22. David is described as a man after God's own heart. Look at Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter 13 and verse number 22. Acts 13, verse number 22. Um, in fact, look back at verse number 21. It says, And afterward they desired a king. And remember, because they God gave them a king because they asked for one, not that he wanted them to have one. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So why did God choose David? Because he was a man after his own heart. Yeah. Turn back to 1 Samuel 16, verse number 13. 1 Samuel 16, verse number 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So Samuel anoints David and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. Now we, we need to understand, this is different from the indwelling yeah. of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now I've preached whole sermons on this before, I'm not going to go through and do it now, but you need to understand that in the Bible, the Bible talks about there's the indwelling of the Spirit. Okay, and that was something that didn't happen until after Jesus was risen from the dead. It wasn't until he was risen from the dead. In fact, if you look at John chapter number 7, look, at, look in the New Testament at John chapter number 7, verse number 37, John chapter number 7 and verse number 37, John 7 and verse 37, it says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him, notice this, should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus hadn't, he hadn't risen from the dead. The Holy Spirit at this point was not given. Look at uh, chapter number 14, John chapter number 14, and verse number 16. John chapter number 14, John chapter 14, and verse number 16. It says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Who is this comforter? Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So notice he says he dwells with you. But he's going to be in you. And then he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And there we can see, because over and over, we see throughout the scriptures, you know, Jesus, the Holy Ghost, God the Father, Jesus said, you know, I and my Father are one. It's, it's you know, the mystery of the Trinity. The fact that you've got, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And over and over, I mean, Jesus says right here, he says, look, he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Look, if you would, at... Um, Chapter number 15, verse number 26. Chapter number 15, verse number 26. It says, But when the Comforter has come, whom, notice this, I will send unto you from the Father, 
Even the spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. So notice this. The comfort is going to come. Who's going to send him from the Father? Jesus. Jesus is going to send the comforter. But then look at chapter number 16. Chapter number... Uh, excuse me, I've just lost my place. Where were we? Uh, chapter number 16... Oh, sorry, I missed out verse number 26 of the previous chapter. Verse number 26 of the previous chapter, verse chapter John 14, 16, says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance, whatsoever I've said unto you. So chapter number 14 says that the Father's going to send him, and chapter number 15 says Jesus is going to send him. How is that? It's because over and over throughout the Scriptures, you find that the same is attributed to both to Jesus and to the Father. Um... Look at verse number, chapter number 16, verse number 7. John, John chapter 16, verse number 7. It says, Nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. If Jesus doesn't go away, then the Holy Ghost is not going to come. It's, the Holy Ghost is not going to come and dwell the believer. Um, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How about when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. So notice, over and over he says, this is what's going to happen. The Holy Ghost is going to come. But then if we look later on, like for example, in, in, uh, look at Romans chapter number 8. Well, after the Holy Ghost has come, then every believer has the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible says if you don't have the Holy Ghost, if you don't have the Spirit, then you're, you're not of God at all. You're not saved. It says in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse number 8, it says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he has none of his. And notice there interchangeably, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. And if Christ be in you, so who's in you? Christ. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But then it says, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. But hang on a second, here it says the Spirit of, who raised up Jesus from the dead? The Father raised up Jesus. Well, he says, look, if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your bodies by his Spirit, your mortal bodies, by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. And so every believer has the Holy Ghost. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 16. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Look at Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 2. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 2. It says, This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did they receive the Spirit? They received it by the hearing of faith. They heard, they believed, and that's how they got the Holy Spirit. Look at chapter number 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse number 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So notice, it's the Spirit of Christ. It's the Spirit of Jesus. It's the Spirit of the Son. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So we're sealed with the Holy Ghost. We receive the Holy Ghost. That's a, that's a thing that every believer has. Okay? Now, that's in contrast. It's in contrast to have the Holy Ghost as a, as a seal that's upon every believer. That's in contrast with the Holy Ghost coming upon you. You see, the Holy Ghost coming upon you, that's something that happened repeatedly. You can find it in the Old Testament. I mean, the Spirit came on, it was on Saul. The Spirit came upon David. And, and, and the, look at the book of Acts. Look at the book of Acts. And over and over through the book of Acts, you find, um, look at Acts chapter number 4, for example. Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 8. Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 8. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, 
You know, look down at verse number, verse number 31. Verse number 31, Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. So th- these were disciples, saved believers. Us, they prayed, and what happened? God filled them with his Spirit. Look at chapter number 6. Acts chapter number 6, and verse number 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1, it says, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So there's, there's church problems. These people aren't being provided for enough. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Look, it's not, that's, there's more important things we should be doing. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. You see, they've all got the Holy Ghost, but some of them are full of the Holy Ghost, whom we, may set a, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicon and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And of course, if you look at the end of chapter number seven, we see, remember when Stephen gets stoned? What is he? He's speaking to them, but he's full of the Holy Ghost. Look at chapter number seven, verse number 51. Uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 51. This is Stephen speaking. He says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye'd always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did so to you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. It sounds like just the same thing Peter was saying. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed upon him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Just notice in passing, he's calling upon God. How does he do it? He says, Lord Jesus. Okay, but notice he was filled with the Holy Ghost and you can go throughout the book of Acts and over and over you see people, they're filled, they're filled with the Holy Ghost. This is talking about an empowering by the Holy Ghost for a work that he is to do. Now, if you look back in in chapter number 13, it said um, the spirit of the Lord came upon David. The spirit of the Lord came upon David. Why? Because it was a work that God had for him to do. Now look at verse number 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So in contrast to David, the spirit of the Lord it departs from Saul. Now this is not talking about him losing his salvation, but it's losing the power of God in his life. You see, the same thing can happen to us through disobedience. Through disobedience. Remember, didn't we see in Acts chapter number 5, it talked about the Holy Ghost whom the Lord hath given to them that obey him. Well, what happens if you don't obey him? What's going to happen? The Holy Ghost is... You see, you can be someone who's serving God, you're faithful, but guess what? If you leave that faithfulness, if you go into gross sin, if you, if you disobey God, what's he going to do? Is the Holy Ghost going to be upon you in power? No, he's going to be grieved. Now, he'll still be there. You'll still have the seal of the Holy Ghost, but you won't have the Holy Ghost in power. Look, if you're at Psalm chapter number 51, I mean, this is actually in the light of, in the, um, this is written by David. And so this, this is uh, talking about when David sinned with Bathsheba. Look at uh, Psalm number 51. A man who had the Holy Ghost on him in great power, but what does he say in Psalm 51? He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy love and kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. He's done some wicked things. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest to be clear when thou judgest. Look down, it goes down to... Um, I look at verse, verse number 9. He says, Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all mine iniquities. Verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He's saying, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Now, he, David didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but he had this Holy Spirit upon him in power. And then he says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Because it's not talking about him losing his salvation. But can you lose your joy? Of your salvation? Absolutely. And uphold with thy free spirit. And if you do that, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Okay? And so, it's important we need to understand that we need the Holy Spirit upon us in power, but we can lose that power. We can lose that. And you'll see it. 
I mean, there are people who have been used by God, greatly used by God, and then sin comes into their life. Yeah. Now, obviously, sin's in everyone's life. Yeah. But the, the amount of sin increases and multiplies. And what happens? God removes his power from them. Yeah. You know? I mean, think about, there are pastors around who, you know, they never used to have a TV. Yes. But now they do. And so instead of meditating in God's word, they're sitting being fed. Do you think the Holy Spirit's going to hang around there? Or do you think they're going to lose that power? Yeah. They're going to lose that power. Okay? And, but not only, if we look back at 1 Samuel chapter 16, not only, we see here Saul, he lost the, the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. An evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So what that means is there was actually a spirit that was evil, a harmful spirit from God. You say, well, what, what, is this like some, you know, what's this talking about? I mean, I think this is actually talking about like a, I mean, obviously you've got good spirits, you've got angels, yep. but you've got devils, yep. fallen angels. Yep. And God can allow those things into our lives. Now, they can never come, they can never possess a believer, but they can trouble them. They can trouble them. I mean, look at an example of this in, in 2 Chronicles chapter number 18. 2 Chronicles chapter number 18. 2 Chronicles chapter number 18 and verse number 18. <clears throat> 2 Chronicles chapter 18 and verse number 18 says, And again he said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, and all the host of heaven standing before him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall entice Ahab king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one spake, and one spake saying after this manner, another saying after that manner. Then there came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. So here we see God's allowing this lying, evil spirit to be in the mouth of, of the prophets that are going to lead, you know, lead Ahab the wrong way. Okay, and so God allowed that to happen. It's kind of like, remember how didn't God allow... Satan himself, to cause bad things to happen in Job's life. He did. Now, God had to, once again, he had to allow that. Why? Because there was a hedge around Job. Why? Because God, Job was living a righteous, godly life. So he was protected. He was safe from Satan. He was safe from these bad things. God allowed, you know, I mean, Job's probably thinking, why did he allow it? But that way we could read the book of Job and see what happened. Okay? And Job, he kept his integrity. And then in the end, you know, God, you know, he, he had more children and, and all that sort of stuff. And obviously... You know, he had twice as many children yes. as he probably would have had otherwise, you know, and they're all in heaven, etc. So, but here we can see Saul is troubled by this evil, evil spirit. If you look at verse number 15, people know it. Yeah. Verse 15, and Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Verse number 16, Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is cunning, a cunning player on an harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. So they've got this idea that someone playing music is going to get rid of an evil spirit. Now, is that, going to, is that really going to work? I don't know. I mean, it's, I think it's probably true that the wrong sort of music could expose you to evil spirits. Yeah. The wrong sort of music could expose you to evil spirits. I mean, you listen to satanic music that blasphemes God, you know? I mean, I, 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 mean, I used to listen to bad music when I was a teenager, you know? And some, some of the bands, some of the lyrics that they have, I remember listening to like the... Um, what was it being? Uh, the Cure was one I used to listen to. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember the, the lyrics. Was, I'm paralysed by the blood of Christ. It's like, yeah. what is that all about? Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty satanic. And, and there is, you know, some of that, some of that metal, yes. you know. And, and you look at all the images. It's all these wicked things. Yeah. Well, guess what? If you listen to that, yeah. what's it going to do? Yeah. You know, it's just the same way people open, open up their lives to demonic influences through drugs. Yeah. You know, you take drugs. Yeah. What can happen? You're going to lose your mind completely. You're opening yourself up to that. You know, same thing with drinking alcohol. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a reason they call it spirits. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, now, it's true, you can, you can look on the other side. There are some sorts of music that they can help you relax, you know? They can help you feel, feel better, you know? I mean, I often listen to instrumental music when, I, when I'm working, you know, when I'm programming, when I'm, when I'm preparing sermons. You know, it can help with concentration as well as yeah. it can cover noise that might be going on and things like that. But on the other side, some people, they actually use religious music to cover up something else. Yes. They use religious music to cover up the fact that they don't love God, yeah. that they don't obey God. 
Because, I mean, if you think about, think about worldly music, think about worldly music. Doesn't worldly music, doesn't it, isn't it a lot of it, it's about love, isn't it? It's all about relationships, you know, and, and love and, and that sort of stuff. Well, modern Christian music seems to be an imitation of worldly music, but it just substitutes God instead of singing about a person. You know, I remember back in this church we used to go to years ago, what would we sing? We'd sing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. But of course, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's how we show our love for God, is by obeying him. You know, look, if you're at Psalm, look at Psalm 18, because you, you will actually find those words. Look at Psalm number 18. Psalm 18 and verse number 1. <clears throat> Psalm 18 and verse number 1. Psalm 18, verse number 1. It says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Sounds like I love you, Lord. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. So notice, I love you, Lord. And I'm going to praise you, Lord. But then... Don't stop reading the psalm. Look down at verse number 21. Verse number 21. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. What is that talking about? They're still going to obey him. I've kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. That's talking about his commandments. I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him and I kept myself from mine iniquity. It's talking about not sinning, doing what God says to do. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands and his eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with an upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward thou wilt show thyself froward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. You see, that's why it's important to, to go into the, the Psalms, to go into the Scriptures, because it describes what's right and what's wrong. Bring down high looks. It's talking about pride. For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by thee have I run through a troop. And by my God, I've leapt over all. Notice it's talking about stuff that you've done. You see, when you're just singing praise to God, hey, there's nothing wrong with singing praise to God. But when you're just singing, you know, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, but you're not doing what God wants you to do. God says, no, look, I've got things I want you to do. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a buckler to all those that trust in him. Trust him. For who is God save the Lord, or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. Notice this. He maketh my feet like hind's feet and setteth me upon my high places. Notice feet. That's talking about, what do you use feet for? You go. You do stuff with them. How about go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? He teacheth my hands to war so that the bow of steel is broken by mine arms. And thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and the, thy right hand hath holden me up and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. So notice, let's talk about what you do, what you do with your hands, what you do with your feet. You see, it is true that God, the Bible says that God dwells in, I think it's Psalm 22. Psalm 22, it says, um, yeah, Psalm 22, 3 says, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. You see, God dwells in the praises of his people, but it shouldn't just be praise. It shouldn't just be praise. Look, if you were at um, Hebrews chapter number 13, Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 15. You say, what's this got to do with 1 Samuel? You, you'll see in a second. Look at Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 15. 1 Samuel 13 and verse number... Sorry, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 15. It says, By him, therefore, it's talking about Jesus, therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So notice, the sacrifice of praise. Praising God is likened to being a sacrifice. Well, what do we see back in Samuel? What do we see back in Samuel? It says, Behold, to obey yeah. is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. You see, God's interested in obedience. Should we live sacrificial lives? Should we praise God? Absolutely. But obeying him, obeying him is the key thing. And that's, that's where Saul was falling short. Look at verse number 17. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite that is cunning and playing, and a mighty valiant man, a man of war and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. So Saul, he says, Look, bring, bring me someone who can play well, and the person they get is David. You know, oh, David sounds like he had a lot of strings to his bow, doesn't he? 
you know, he was a skilled musician. He was a valiant fighter. He was prudent or wise, we might say. God is with him. Well, we should be the same. You see, it's great to excel in one area, but we should seek to excel in multiple areas. You know, physically. You know, you don't be a physical wreck. Don't be a physical wreck. Mentally, don't be, you know, don't be stupid. You know, spiritually, we should be righteous. We should be spiritual people. You know, don't, don't think, well, oh, I'm going to give all my work to the ministry and then you neglect your family. You know, yeah. we need to be balanced. You know, don't think, oh, I'm going to do all this, but then, you know, I'm not going to do the work. You know, we've got work that we need to do. In fact, if you look at, look at David, verse number 19, where, wherefore Saul sent messages unto Jesse and said, send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. What was David doing? He's working. You know, so he's got all these things and he's, he's, he's doing, he's a man after God's own heart. If you want to be a man after God's own heart, you need to be excelling, excelling in all areas of your life. Now, we're all going to come short, but hey, look at an area and think, how can I improve? What can I do better? What would be more pleasing to God? Verse number 20. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. So, um, Jesse sends David along with some along with some gifts, you know, to Saul. He becomes his armor bearer, and Saul Saul loves David. In fact, it says, um, uh, "Where are we?" Verse number verse number twenty two. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, "Let David, pray, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight." Saul loves David; he finds favor in his sight. Don't need to turn there, but it says in Proverbs chapter number. Actually, turn to Proverbs chapter number 22. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 22. And while you do, I'll just read from you from Proverbs chapter number 3. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 22. It says in Proverbs 3 verse 1, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall I add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Notice this. So shall thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. We should be finding favour. And that's what David was like. He was someone who found favour. He found favour in the sight of Saul. Look at um, Proverbs chapter number 22. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before me men. Why? Because they're excelling. Why? Because they're diligent. Back in 1 Samuel chapter number 16. 1 Samuel chapter number 16, verse number 23. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So David, he plays the harp, the evil spirit, the troubled Saul, it departs from him. But of course, it's only really for a time. As you read through the book, guess what? The spirit's going to be back and Saul's going to be troubled. You know, it didn't really fix the problem. Because of course, the problem was Saul's disobedience. His disobedience. And as we read through 1 Samuel, it's just going to get worse. So what we've seen in this chapter, you know, Basically, after rejecting Saul as king, what does God do? He chooses another king. He chooses David, the shepherd boy. He's, he's called the sweet psalmist of Israel. He's a man after God's own heart. But he's a man who's going to fall into grievous sin. And he's going to bring destruction to his own family. And it's important that we remember throughout this that God never designed people to have a king. He was supposed to be their ruler. You see, when men are given too much power, it corrupts them. You know, that's a saying. It's not, it's not in the Bible, but it's a true saying. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's true. The more power you give a man, it's going to corrupt them. You know? I mean, First Timothy chapter 3, you don't need to turn there, but it, it warns about the danger of bishop being lifted up with pride and falling into reproach and the snare of the devil. It particularly warns about someone who is a novice being susceptible. And you say, well, okay, but okay, well, I'm not a novice. I'll, I'll be fine. Well, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 12, it says, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. If you think, do you think you're doing okay? You think you're safe? You're standing? He says, look, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Actually, look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Look at verse number, verse number 13. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you or allow you to be tempted above that you're able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Notice that. With the temptation, there's a way to escape. There's a way to escape the temptation. How do you stand in the face of temptation? Helping, you know, listening to godly music. 
That didn't really help Saul in the long run. What should he really have done? He should have humbled himself. He should have humbled himself. It was pride that brought him down. And we can, I mean, we can see that throughout the scriptures. Throughout the scriptures, pride is a thing that brings people down. I mean, Satan himself was lifted up with pride. He wanted to be like the Most High. Look at Proverbs chapter number 6. See what God thinks about pride. Proverbs chapter number 6, verse 16. It says, These six things doth the Lord hate. There are things that God hates. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. What's the first one? A proud look. A proud look. God hates a proud look. And a lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Someone who's thinking evil thoughts. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. Notice someone who's lying. I thought we heard that already. Yes, we did. A lying tongue. God really hates liars. Well, guess what? When people are proud, what do they do? They tell lies. They tell lies. Look at, look at Proverbs chapter number 15. Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 25. God hates lying. In fact, he will bring judgment upon pride. Look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 25. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 25. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Notice that. God is going to judge. Look at chapter number 16. Chapter 16, verse number 5. Everyone that is, a, that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Look at verse 19. Um, oh, in fact, verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Pride goes before destruction. Look at chapter number 21. Chapter, Proverbs chapter number 21, verse number 4. Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 4. And high look and a proud heart and the ploughing of the wicked is sin. Lifted up, prideful, high looks. That's sin. Look at verse number 24. Verse number 24. Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. Here we notice pride is associated with being haughty, with being a scorner, with being, you know, dealing with proud wrath. Someone who gets really angry. Someone who's filled with rage. Yeah. Be filled with rage, yeah. it's quite likely... That he's filled with pride. Look at, uh, look at Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. You see we find the pride being on some pretty lists of some pretty bad things. Look at Romans, Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 28. Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 28. And it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. Look at this. Fornication. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. But then look, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient appearance, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. There's some pretty bad things on that list. There's some pretty bad things on that list. And one of them is pride. It's pride. Look at first, uh, first Timothy chapter number 6. First Timothy chapter number 6. First Timothy chapter number 6. You see, one of the signs of pride is the words that come out of your mouth. The words that come out of your mouth. First Timothy chapter number 6 and verse number 3. It says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, watch out for unwholesome words. Yeah. Consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. If they don't consent to that, they teach other than that. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, there goes those evil thoughts again, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw, them, withdraw thyself. Notice he's proud and these things are coming out of his mouth, but notice he's worried about gain. We won't bother going on, but you know what comes next in First Timothy 6. The love of money is the root of all evil. You know, you look where people are proud. I mean, isn't that one of the things that causes people to be proud? You know, if, if the love of money. They never used to have much money and now they've got more. And they say, now they're starting to feel, well, I got this because I deserve it. Yeah. And they're filled with pride. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's, it's a bad thing. I mean, and, in fact, it's actually interesting when you think about it. Because here it says, look, when people are speaking the perverse disputings, perverse words coming out of someone's mouth. That's a sign of pride. How do, you, how do we know Saul was proud? Well, we know that he was little in his own sight at the start, but he wasn't later on. 
and you don't need to turn there, but later on in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 20 verse 30, when he starts, he gets mad with David, and then he gets mad with Jonathan, because obviously Jonathan is, is, you know, loves David, is helping him out. What, is, what does um, Saul say to him? He calls his own son, he calls him the son of the perverse, rebellious woman. <laughs> I mean, what sort of things are coming out of Saul's mouth? He's saying to his own son, you're the son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Okay? I think it, it sounds like, like Saul doesn't know how to control his tongue. Look, if you were to James chapter number four, just a couple of quick places we'll look. James chapter number four, we're almost done. This is just the conclusion. James chapter number four, verse number five. James chapter four, verse number five. James chapter four, verse number five. It says, Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace? Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You want God on your side? Be humble rather than proud. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. And then look at verse number 11. Speak not evil one of another brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? The sign of pride is someone who's he's judging fellow believers. He's telling you what's going on inside their heart when he doesn't even know. His words betray him. His words betray him. Contrast it with 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. When he says, because some of the people that do this are people that are in positions of authority in churches. Pastors, bishops, elders. In the independent Baptist movement, things will come out of their mouths that shouldn't. It's evidence of pride. Look what Peter says. First Peter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, whom also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partake of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre, filthy lucre, notice that, danger of money, but of a ready mind. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So don't be a lord, don't be bossing over people, being an example. In other words, the people in the congregation, do you want them to do what you're doing? Do you want them to stand up and say the things that you're saying? You should be an example to them. And yet, so many, I've heard pastors, it's like, you're allowed to say, pastor, it's okay for a pastor to say this, but you can't say that to a pastor? No. We're all brethren. Yeah. We're all brethren. You're supposed to be an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Yeah. For here it goes again. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He's going around looking for people to devour. Who's he going to devour? How about the person who's lifted up with pride? Yeah. The person who's lifted up with pride, because all of a sudden, guess what? Yeah. God's going to resist them. They're not under his protection anymore. They're susceptible. But he says, look, you need to, whom resist steadfast in the faith. You need to resist the devil. But the way to do that is not to be prideful, to be humble. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that he had suffered a while make you perfect. Establish, strength, and settle you. Notice verse number 11. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Notice the glory is supposed to go to God. But the problem with, with, with pride is it takes the glory and honor that should be given to God and gives it to himself. You know, glory, look at me, look at me. And if you see someone that's drunk, what are, what are they saying in 1 Corinthians 13? Vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Last place we'll turn, because we'll sing it. Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 12. The problem with Saul was pride. It was pride. He was disobedient. But I mean, when you're filled with pride, then you're going to be disobedient. I mean, we, we, actually we sang earlier on, remember we sang about the, in Proverbs 7, the, the woman, that woman. Remember the, the, the strange woman? She was loud and stubborn. What is loud and stubborn? Oh, now, loud sounds like proud. But when someone's loud and they're stubborn, are they humble? Doesn't sound like it. 
you're there in Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. Look at verse number 3. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. It says, For, for I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Pride. We need to avoid it. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. I mean, look at Jesus. You know, in, in Philippians chapter number 2. You know, esteem others better than themselves. Um, look at verse number 10. Verse number 10, he says, Be kindly affection one to another, with brotherly love, and honour preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Once again, watch out what's coming out of your mouth. Verse 16, be of the same mind one to another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Okay? Not lying. Being honest. If it be possible as much as lieth then you live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Make no mistake. God will repay pride. He will repay it. And you see it. People who are lifted up. There's going to be a judgment. God will judge. Don't think you can get away with it. Because you, if you're lifted up with pride, you, you think you're someone special, yeah. then what's going to happen? He's going to bring you low. Just like Nebuchadnezzar. Then yeah. what happened to him? You know, he's eating like an animal, crawling around on his hands and knees, eating grass. You know, God lifts up. God can bring you down. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray you'd help each one of us just to, to guard against the sin of pride. Help us to be humble. Help us to be little in our own sight. Help us to be men and women and children after your own heart. Help us to be in your word. Help us to be conformed to your word. To be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Lord, help us to walk in a way that pleases you. And we know that that way is not the way of pride. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.